Insta360, best known for their 360 camera, recently released an update to their Insta360 Go action camera, the Go 2. And this is not a 360 camera, but is instead similar to the GoPro with one main difference, and that it's tiny. The Go 2 builds on the success of the original Insta360 Go, but with some important updates that bring it more in line with the specs of the GoPro, but in a much smaller form factor and at a slightly lower price. So in this video, I'm going to take a look at how the Go 2 stacks up against the GoPro in terms of its features and image quality. I'll talk about the post-production workflow of the Go 2 and where I personally see this fitting into my filmmaking toolbox. Now, I'm not going to do a full review of every single feature in detail because there have already been a ton of those released on YouTube in the past few days. Instead, I'm going to focus on the features and use cases most relevant to trail runners and adventure filmmakers like myself. Let me start by saying for full disclosure that Insta360 did send me this camera for free to test out in advance of its release, but they did not pay me to review it and they had no control over what I would say. And as you'll see in this video, while I definitely think there are some great positives about this camera, there are also a lot of limitations. So if you're new to the channel, my name is Jeff Peltier and I'm a trail runner and filmmaker based in Vancouver, Canada. And I love telling stories about my experiences on the trail, including in races and on self-supported adventures. Now, even though I'm a professional video producer by trade, for me, it's never just about the quality of a camera when it comes to my adventure films. I also consider weight, the size, and a camera's ease of use. And that is where the Insta360 GO 2 really shines. And the first thing that struck me was just how tiny this thing really is. The camera itself weighs only 26 grams or just under an ounce. And this means you can clip it in places and get shots that even a GoPro can't. It comes with a bunch of different clips and they also sent me some optional GoPro mount adapters. So I was able to use it with my existing GoPro handles and mounts like my helmet mount. The camera is actually magnetic as well, which makes it really easy to clip in and out of some of the mounting brackets and to stick directly to metal surfaces to get some pretty unique shots. When compared directly to the GoPro Hero 8 and especially the larger Hero 9, you can see just how small and light this really is. The GoPro 9 with the battery and card weighs 159 grams or 5.6 ounces, which is more than six times the weight of the Insta360 GO 2. Of course, the GoPro Hero 9 has not only a large rear-facing screen, but also a front-facing screen, while the Go 2 has neither. It requires instead that you use the Insta360 app to preview your shots, which I'll talk about in more detail later in the video. Something else to keep in mind though is that you will, in most cases, need to carry the charging case with you as well. So this extra bulk and weight needs to be considered as well if you're counting grams like me. But the Go 2 case and camera combined only weigh 89 grams or three ounces and in a smaller form factor than the GoPro Hero 9. One thing to note though is that while the camera is completely waterproof, the charging case is not, which is a bit of a shame and it means that I'll need to keep it in a Ziploc bag in my pack when on the trails. The Go 2 is capable of filming at a couple of different resolutions and in a couple of different modes, but let me simplify it for you and say right away that you're going to want to film in its highest resolution of 1440p and in what's called Pro Mode, which unlocks the camera's flow state stabilization. While there is no 4K option, 1440p should be plenty for social videos, and I think in many cases even for adventure films as well. For many of my own films, I capture most of my footage in 2.7K on the GoPro if I'm worried I might run out of space while spending several days on the trail. But I've got to be honest, I would have loved to have seen a 4K option as well here like many of the other cameras that are around this price point. The Go 2 also does not have a removable battery like the GoPro, relying instead on an internal rechargeable battery capable of up to 30 minutes of recording time at 1440p in Pro Video mode. You can then recharge the camera using the included case, which takes about 35 minutes. So it's much like a pair of Apple AirPods. This makes it really easy and cost effective for the more casual user who could then charge the camera in its case when it's not in use. But right away, this tells me that I likely won't be relying on it as a primary camera for my longer adventures, where I would definitely prefer to carry a handful of spare batteries like I do with my GoPro. I've had my coffee in the shot the whole time. And similarly, the camera relies on internal storage instead of a removable micro SD card like on a GoPro. 
It's capable of recording up to about 30 minutes of footage at 1440p in pro mode on its built-in 32 gigabytes of storage. So basically a single battery charge worth of footage. And for some people, this may be plenty of space, but I typically shoot at least an hour of footage per day. So again, this is gonna prevent me from relying solely on this camera to tell stories, especially when I'm out for more than a day on the trail. I really would have expected to see a lot more storage in this camera or preferably even for the option of removable microSD cards. But I do understand why this limitation exists. There's likely just no way to fit all of that into such a small camera without having both the battery and the memory fully integrated. So I think this is just where a trade-off exists between features and size. But what I really wanted to do was put the camera to the test in order to look at both the stabilization and the image quality and not just on a bright day, but also in low light, because that's where these action cameras with their smaller sensors tend to really struggle, and the GoPro is no exception. So with there being so much snow here in the mountains, the first test footage I shot was on skis in the backcountry, and here it performed really well as I expected it would. Right away, I noticed how much lighter it felt on my helmet. In fact, I couldn't even tell it was there and actually kept worrying that I'd lost it. Whereas when I'm wearing a GoPro, I can definitely feel it. This footage was filmed at 1440p in pro mode with the default vivid color setting with no additional color correction done at all. And I think it looks pretty good and the highlights held up surprisingly well. But my main use case, of course, for action cameras is for running. So I then took it to the track for a side-by-side -side comparison with the GoPro Hero 9 using this dual camera adapter for my GoPro handle. And this time I set the camera to log, which is similar to the flat setting on the GoPro, but even flatter. Now this footage might look horrible to the untrained eye, but a professional will know that the flatter the image, the better, in order to preserve the most information possible so that the footage can then be graded in post-production. I always film in a flat color profile on the GoPro, and that's how I get such good exposure in my footage. Now, like the GoPro, the Go2 does allow you to manually set the ISO and shutter speed, as well as the white balance. This will definitely provide much better results under certain conditions, but even I typically leave these settings on auto when filming on the run, because lighting conditions can be just too variable, and I don't wanna have to keep stopping to adjust these settings. So I figured my test footage should reflect this as well. In a side-by-side -side comparison with the GoPro, I think it actually provides an even more stable image. I've purposely left this footage in log and the GoPro footage in flat with no color correction because I wanted you to focus on the stabilization and not on the color saturation or contrast, which can easily be changed in post-production when working with either camera. I've also left both cameras in full auto mode in terms of exposure. It's got a similar horizon lock feature like the GoPro Hero 9 and with a similar wide field of view. I then took it out on the trails to see how it would perform under lower light conditions. And again, this is just on the default automatic exposure settings, so it may be possible to get better results with certain manual settings. But it was important for me to see how the camera performs naturally. Something I learned early on in working with GoPros is that the stabilization on these little action cameras relies heavily on having a fast shutter speed. When filming in lower light, the camera is then forced to use a slower shutter speed in order to expose the image for longer, which is why the stabilization becomes such a problem. Now let's talk about post-production. Just like with the Insta360 ONE X, footage from the Go2 can be edited directly in the mobile app or in the Insta360 Studio software on a Mac or PC. You can also get a plugin that allows you to work with your footage directly in Adobe Premiere or After Effects. But what's really cool is that when filming in pro video mode, the Go2 records what is essentially a 180 degree perspective as a square image. This means that you can change the field of view as well as both the stabilization and horizontal lock options, and even the orientation between vertical and landscape later in the software, no matter what you may have had it set to while recording. This is definitely not possible on the GoPro where what you film is what you get, and there is no discernible quality loss from what I can tell when changing these settings after the fact. The original video file is actually in 2880 by 2880 resolution, so when you change the FOV, it's actually got pixels to spare before rendering the final 1440p image. 
Another point for the Go 2 though here is that you can export from Insta360 Studio in Apple ProRes format instead of just MP4, which is a really nice feature for us professionals. Rendering can take a bit of time, but it's something that can be queued up and left overnight. So you'll just need to factor this time into your workflow when planning your edit. Okay, so time for my final thoughts here on this camera. Now, first of all, will it replace my GoPro entirely? Definitely not. I need the ability to swap out batteries and memory cards when it comes to my longer adventures, but I do see a place for it in my toolkit. There are lots of times when even a GoPro is just too big and heavy to bother carrying with me, and that's when I'll likely reach for the Go 2. In fact, this thing is so small that I'll likely just start to throw the camera itself in my pack when in doubt, even without the charging case, just in case I need a second angle or to serve as a backup to my GoPro. I think this is where the Go 2 really shines. It's for those shots you can't otherwise get. For example, you could very easily clip this to the brim of your hat, onto the end of a running pole, or directly onto your running vest. It's so unobtrusive that it won't be nearly as obvious to those around you that you're filming as it is when you're holding a GoPro. So I could see leaving this hooked up onto my running vest basically the whole time during a race so that I can just really quickly tap the button to start recording if I'm maybe on like a really cool section of trail where I wouldn't otherwise want to bother getting up my GoPro and having to hold it. Or really any time I might want some footage but need both of my hands, like at an aid station. Similarly, any sports that I might want some no hands POV footage where I'm not wearing a helmet and therefore can't or just don't want to mount a large GoPro to my head. But at a price point similar now to the GoPro Hero 8, you're gonna have to decide for yourself whether it would make sense to buy this camera to simply supplement your other cameras. I see it much like a drone where you may not use it very often, but when you do, you'll be glad that you have it. These kinds of tools can help to get really interesting angles and to capture footage in circumstances we might not otherwise be able to, allowing us to tell more engaging and immersive stories. So you can definitely expect to see shots from this camera in my future films. So what do you think? Would you see a place for this in your filmmaking toolkit? Or do you think this could even meet your needs as a primary action camera? Tell me about it in the comments below. And if you've found this video helpful, then do me a favor and give it a like. I've got a similar review in the works of the Insta360 ONE X Mark II, the newest 360 camera from Insta. So stay tuned for that. And until then, remember the best camera is the one that you have on you.